So it's the 6th of November 2023, which basically means that um, D9 and D10 have been launched. So it's kind of all official now. It's all here. So the initial options are obviously that you can either do a single, um, a double single or an EP. I'm going to do an LP, well, 12 track album. I've done this kind of thing before. You know, I've kind of challenged myself in the recording world to kind of do things like this because a lot of what I do musically really doesn't revolve around performing. It's purely just kind of sitting in my room with a guitar and uh, just experimenting around with like garage band and things like that. But this one's going to be like a, a proper professional attempt at an album, a studio album. And just to kind of wrap a bow around the whole thing, it's going to be complete with like a choir and an orchestra. And also, I'm going to be playing like pretty much all the instruments myself, except for anything, uh, you know, orchestra related, because I, I could not play a violin to save my life. But any guitar, bass, drums, vocals, well, lead vocals and keys mainly so that obviously includes like pianos synths that kind of thing those are all going to be me and obviously the songwriting itself is done by me the whole arrangement of the thing is me what do you need from me what symbols I'm ready. We are go. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry to be annoying again. Hold on. Yeah, okay, ready. Literally as ready as I've ever been. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So yesterday I was down in London, I went over to Abbey Road basically for this talk called Abbey Road Amplify. It's kind of an event similar to Industry Week, but they get, you know, people who are much more notable, I'll tell you that. James Ford, the producer, I, I listened to one of his talks, it was absolutely incredible. If you didn't know, he's like one of the world's biggest producers. He's worked with the Arctic Monkeys, he's worked with Depeche Mode, Blur for God's sake. So it was really cool being down there first off. So I was lucky enough to be sitting in Studio 2 listening to James Ford talk about how mixing works, you know, how he approaches mixing, and a couple of the tips that he would have for younger producers and younger artists like myself. And me being the nerd I am, I took some notes. But these notes are from actual conversation with James Ford. Honestly, the things he was saying kind of blew my mind a bit. Because obviously he's like a top producer, you know, he has access to quite a lot of, you know, materials, a lot of the new technology. But one of the main things he said was that top end equipment really isn't all that. Sometimes you just get a much warmer edge by using older equipment. Like we found that out pretty early on when doing demos in college anyway. It just, it was really, really inspiring hearing somebody in the industry actually saying it. He was also saying kind of use what you can I think that was interesting because obviously as a younger artist you would generally not have access to all that much stuff so you do have to be a little bit more creative with the things that you do which i think is much better actually than having all this top end equipment available to you but also don't think too hard when you're mixing don't think about trying to make something much clearer by adding a bunch of effects to it literally just make it as simple as you can but just don't think too hard about the actual mix he also said be vulnerable when you're doing your own solo projects be vulnerable make it a challenge for yourself because you know at the end of the day if you make it more difficult then you'll learn lots more stuff along the way and he also said the traditional ways often do just work best those old ways of mixing that's why records from like the 50s and 60s are still timeless today you know even against well-produced tracks like by the biggest artists in the world you have a song like be my baby or love me do and those still sound absolutely stellar but that's because they've used traditional techniques you know because they had to they had to you know innovate this studio technique because you couldn't venture too far from home territory because obviously you might have only had two tracks to work with but then another big big thing like i was kind of saying with warmth saturation it really isn't all that bad and i also put a little note saying tom was right because this is something that tom had told us before but saturation really really can help 
because like I was saying with warmth when something sounds a lot more natural a lot more you know a lot more comfortable that's that's why it's called warmth and yeah just making things sound as as comfortable for you as possible you know just so, just something that you think you're gonna have a lot of fun with just do what you think's right you know and, and have have your fun with it but ultimately i think that was pretty much it you know it was really really interesting talk he was kind of separating out the um stems for something that he'd been working on with depeche mode so in conversation with james ford i've got quite a few new ideas for my album obviously the main thing that I have in mind is home territory. This idea that, you know, doing what's comfortable for you and, you know, trying to make something that you're going to enjoy is easily the most important thing because if you're not serving yourself, then you're serving no one. And it's more likely that you're just going to hate what you come up with and, you know, you've got to love what you do. But he was a really, really awesome guy. It was, it was awesome to meet and to talk to. And also his favourite Beatle is George Harrison. Just thought I'd point that one out. But being in that space, being in Studio 2, I think made it all the, all the better, really, for me. Because <laughs> first of all, I'm in the room where, like, my heroes were working. But then also you've got so many other artists, you know, their pictures are on the wall. You've got people like Shirley Bassey, you've got John Williams. Artists from all over have been to Abbey Road and they've done their thing. You can see why they did it in Abbey Road. And I do feel very, very privileged to have gone. I... At the end of the day, I was invited along and the talk was absolutely incredible. James, as per the usual, was just brilliant. And now I feel really, really confident that I know what I'm doing with my album. Because talking to an actual producer and him saying, just do what you want to do, that's unlocked a whole new door for me. Now I'm no longer afraid of what people are going to think because at the end of the day, one of the world's best producers told me just do what you want to do. The only restraint that I have with being in college, the only things I, I must absolutely do in college are any of the acoustic instruments that I don't own. Drums. I have an electric drum kit, that ain't gonna make the cut. I've been told I'm allowed to use a live piano, or at least somebody's gonna try and help me get over there. I've also got the orchestra and choir that I've gotta record. The choir is less of a problem because where we rehearse for choir, it's this little room, it's a seminar room, but it's done in quite a good way. It's rather soundproofed, there's no real echo to the room. And I think if I was to set up a couple of condenser mics in that room, I'd be able to record the choir no problem. So all my recording will have to take place on Thursday, you know, things like the orchestra, having them in, I doubt I'm going to get any other studio time during the week, but if I do, of course, that's going to be brilliant, getting all the orchestra members in and just trying to record all their different parts. My plan is to kind of do it in bursts, you know. If like a violinist came in, for example, you know, ready to record some violin tracks, I'd pull up the sheet music for every single track that needed a violin and just try and get through as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, welcome back to the studio. Hello, Hugh Hello. Lloyd. This is the drum setup. Um, I will tell you, I'll give you a guided tour. Two overheads, of course, standard in studios. One called the uh, well, the, the high, and one called the rye. You can, it's easy to tell the difference. Got the snare mic, the tom mic, the other tom mic, and all the way around here, the kick mic. All going into the one system, which is going in through the thing, and the we're going to record. Definitely one of the more upbeat numbers on the album. This is called Lovers of Feeling. I'm going to be doing the main riff guitar. I think uh, I'm not sure how much energy I'm going to be able to put into this, but we're going to give it a go. Uh, we do have the official drums. We don't have anything else on the track. So it's literally just me on the guitar and me on the drums. This is it. The main riff is kind of... I want people to think British Invasion, that kind of thing. Um, I keep thinking of The Who whenever you know, I'm recording something like this. So I guess that's the best thing you can base it on. If you get a song like, uh, like I Can't Explain by The Who, that's probably a perfect example, to be fair. It's like... 
you know, using those really, really high up bar chords. It's the same sort of thing. But yeah, um, I'm gonna give it a go. Uh, hope you like the sound of it. And here we go. Okay, so um, this is like a short video that I kind of captured of what I was doing sort of at the time uh, on Canva. As you can see, I'm kind of flicking through the different uh, text options here. It actually was kind of difficult to decide on a, a, a text type that I wanted for, you know, for my album, for, for, for my career, really. Because honestly, I, I, I like don't, I'm not really into the whole graphic design element of everything. It's kind of, it's important for me to get a look, like a certain look or a certain aesthetic. Thing is, I was always going to kind of go with the, the very, very uh, basic fonts, you know, so things like Arial, those sort of, I think it's Sans Serif, you know, those kind of fonts. You know, in this, in this video particularly, you can kind of see I'm, I'm like really indecisive. Like there's a, a few that I kind of stop at and I sort of like, but I, I don't really stay at for long because I don't feel like they evoke the right sort of vibe. Now this was a font I actually stopped on and I was sort of just like, oh, okay, this could actually evoke the right feelings here. Because it's kind of, it's it's standard in the sense that it's very like, very bold and very kind of there. But it, obviously it's not a sans serif because it's got those little serif -y bits on it. But it, it's also, it's it's got that 3D element to it, which I really liked. Sort of a bit, a bit more blocky, a bit more systematic, you know. Then of course I sort of transferred that to the logo in the end. And then I noticed that shape. That was in the that was in like the the gallery of like automatic shapes. And I thought, wait, that's perfect. That's exactly what I need. The thing I'd been struggling with creating this logo was getting that shape. So if you don't know on the on the the penny farthing, which I've kind of shown off already, is that the, like the penny farthing it has that bicycle wheel. Thing is, that's really hard to make. Surprisingly, I thought it'd be just a case of sticking a load of, of sticks on the edge of a circle, but it ended up not working that well, like when I did it in college. Thing is, here, this was the first time I'd actually found something that exactly replicated what I needed, and I was just like, this is perfect, this is brilliant, I love it. Then obviously I was kind of struggling to make the circle, you know, that I'd inserted on top of it. I was struggling to make it into like one... Uh, it, it, like like a rounded circle with no area. And here, of course, you can see me being really, really unfamiliar with Canva. There we go. There, that's when <laughs> that's when I, that's when I worked it out. And then I was like, hmm, maybe maybe I need this to be a little little less thick. So let's let's change the thickness. So that's what I ended up doing. I was sort of just like messing around with the shape. So I was sort of being like, yeah, this is this is actually starting to work out. So then I realised, okay, now I need to do the hard bit, which is to kind of do an angled line, like a like a, a freehand angled line. Um, to sort of create the entire shape. I'd worked out how to do the, the draw tool. You can see I had some, I had some quite some good fun with the thickness tool here. Yep, way too thin, right? And then I sort of just went, hmm, well let's just up the weight. <laughs> that just did not work at all. As much as I like struggled to use Canva, it was actually like really, really quite easy to, to pick up in the end. I was sort of just like in my element looking for different things. I think it just took that extra little leap to actually do this on Canva. What pushed me to do it at first was to sort was literally just by looking online. I was just I was searching for like logo maker and stuff, and I realised we'd already done things with Canva in in college, and I I'd sort of avoided it since doing it in college because I, I really didn't enjoy using it that much. I just thought it was really really hard to use. I think at the time there were only a limited amount of designs on it as well, so you could literally do like a circle, a square. And, you know, maybe a couple of other different shapes. But, you know, I wasn't finding the exact shape I needed. And I think the difficult part about my logo was literally just the wheels. Because that's a very specific shape. Also, I couldn't find a draw tool at the time either. But then when I seemed to log in, you know, <laughs> and do it here, that's when it actually started to work. As you can see here, this is when I get, I get kind of the seats, the handlebars, and whatever the 
middle one is. It kind of looks like a bonsai tree, you know, now that I think about it, but I think I was just trying to get the basic shape, like the absolute basic shape of a penny farthing. But as you can see here, I was, I was just kind of going for it and it actually worked really, really well. Okay, so here's where I, yeah, so I duplicated the same shape. I just couldn't be bothered to go through the, the shape making again. Plus it's, it's, it's literally an identical wheel, but smaller. I just want you to notice here my pure joy. Like you can see me laughing here and then quickly covering my face. Like the amount of times it's taken me to get this right, this actual logo right, is just beyond me. But anyway, I, I was super happy to get it. And yeah, that's it. But yeah, apart from that, that was, that's literally it. So that's the logo like created with Canva in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, start again. You! <laughs>very quick video update this is the third week in a row where i'm in the demo schools room i've got the exact same setup as the previous two weeks which is basically just a kel hm1 microphone with the xlr lead going into the mixing desk here i've got phantom power on so we actually get noise from the microphone going straight into logic going from my backing track just recording the final vocal track for the project and that's literally it
nearly forgetting. <laughs> That speed. Yeah. Other than coming in, we're all right, yeah? <laughs> okay, so we get this.